um, see a lot of obviously students that I, I recognize from um, just every week, but uh, welcome to everyone who's here as a guest. Um, and thanks for coming to this environmental ethics seminar. Um, as many of you know, the environmental ethics seminar series has been going consistently since the environmental ethics pr um, certificate program was created in 1983. So we're um, happy to, to keep these seminar series going. Every semester, we uh, typically have four or five seminars each semester and bring in people from, from here at UGA, um, but also from, from far and wide. So it's a, it's a great um, seminar series, and I'm glad that you all can be here. Um, just a, real quick about the Environmental Ethics Certificate Program. It is an interdisciplinary certificate here at UGA. It um, was created back in 1983 by Eugene Odom and Frederick Ferre, and was the first environmental ethics program in the country. So we've got a long legacy there as well. Um, obviously, uh, part of the intent of that certificate program is to train students to think um, critically about envir complex environmental issues. And typically, these um, issues are, uh, not surprisingly, those that have very many competing perspectives on what is the right path forward. I think we'll see um, some evidence of that uh, here in tonight's talk as well. Um, but these seminars are open to the public, and, um, and I certainly encourage you to keep an eye on upcoming seminars by checking out our calendar on the Environmental Ethics um, Certificate homepage. And uh, you'll, you'll see our updated events there every semester. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. We've got um, Sarah Hitchner from University of Georgia here. She's an assistant research scientist and adjunct professor in the Department of Anthropology here at UGA. Um, John Shellhaas is Emeritus um, Research Forester with the Southern Research Station of the USDA Forest Service, and their co-author, Pete Brosius, is not here, but he's also at um, University of Georgia in the um, Anthropology Department. And um, you can see the title of their talk, Forests as Fuel, Energy, Landscape, Race, and Climate in the U.S. South. That's also the title of their new book that has recently been published. And so. Um, if you, your interest is piqued here tonight, I definitely encourage you to um, take a look at, at purchasing the book. Just r real quick, I'm going to read excerpts of two reviews that I found online when I went to the publisher's website, because I think they, they set the stage nicely. So one says, Hitchner, Shellhaus, and Brosius offer a comprehensive ethnographic analysis of the challenges to sustainable forest-based bioenergy as seen through the eyes of the people of the U.S. South. The authors carefully identify points of friction and opportunities in a sector that needs to be inclusive in its land-based energy quest to respond to a changing climate. Another reviewer says, Forest as Fuel reveals a complicated and compelling story about what technical innovation, technological innovation looks like in rural areas of the South that are fraught with economic challenges and deep racial divides. The book is a must read for anyone interested in wood-based energy development and environmental justice. So I sort of thought those were great reviews, and I'm excited to hear um, about all the work that you guys put into this, this research. So I'm going to turn it over. Welcome. OK. So can everybody hear me OK? Or? OK, in the top. So my name is Sarah Hitchner. I'm here with uh, John Shellhouse, as he mentioned. Uh, Pete could not be here tonight. Um, but we are all cultural anthropologists, so we're on the social science side of things. And we're going to talk today about the ethnographic research that we conducted in multiple sites across the US South that have different kinds of wood-based bioenergy facilities. Uh, we started doing the preliminary field work in 2011. And the bulk of the research, including the ethnography we conducted while we were living in our primary sites for a couple months each, uh, that was conducted between 2011 and 2013. And then for several years afterwards, we continued to attend conferences and maintain communication with people in our field sites. And we're continuing to follow those developments in the field sites and with wood-based bioenergy in general. So we're framing this part of the research in terms of imaginaries, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but basically, these are holistic visions of the way that the world works or the way that the world should work. Um, so we're talking today about a pro-bioenergy uh, imaginary that's you know, um, considered to be a win-win vision 
in which bioenergy uh, promotes energy independence, enhances forest health, strengthens local wood markets, mitigates climate change, and also benefits local communities. However, this imaginary intersects with several competing imaginaries and things can get really messy. So we're gonna talk about that messiness today. Uh, bioenergy development requires that real hard choices must be made and acknowledging that these choices benefit some people, some economies, and some landscapes at the expense of others. Um, our research that we're talking about today is drawing linkages between uh, issues of energy, landscape, climate, and race, and we're showing how each of these issues complicates that pro-bioenergy imaginary that is driving um, the development of it in this region. So first we're gonna take just a quick look at some of the policies that are driving renewable energy development around the world, and then we're going to home in on wood-based bioenergy in the southeastern US because what's happening here in the southeast is directly affected by these policies in other places and on a global scale. And what we're showing in this slide is basically with the EU, their main focus is on climate change. And in the US, it, it was, we found it to be more on national security issues and reducing dependence on foreign oil more than it was framed in terms of climate change. And we're gonna give, um, some examples later about some of our field sites, but a lot of the wood pellets, for example, that are being produced here in the southeast are being shipped to Europe uh, for their renewable energy policies, and that's definitely complicating that, that, uh, that imaginary. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of different stakeholders in bioenergy. Uh, they have different objectives and more importantly, I think different levels of access to power, power to make decisions and to decide how development unfolds. And in many places, such as our field sites, these categories are overlapping. So it's not uncommon, for example, for community leaders to also be large forest landholders who might see themselves directly benefiting from these new markets for wood. Um, so that's something, you, you look at a list like this and you'd realize that a lot of people fit into a lot of different categories. Um, so there are a lot of different claims out there regarding wood-based bioenergy. Some see it as an ideal solution for this region, and others claim it's going to lead to massive deforestation and exacerbate the climate change that it was intended to mitigate. Here we're going to focus on the pro-energy bioimaginary that promotes it as a way forward to achieve those multiple goals, new markets, rural development, climate change, equity issues, uh, national security, and so on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about imaginaries because that's something that we talk a lot about in anthropology and probably other disciplines as well. Um, we're talking here about this idea of socio-technical imaginaries. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, that in terms of Jasanoff and Kim's work. Again, visions of the way the world should work. Um, these imaginaries serve as powerful cultural resources and they shape and support societal efforts to transition to new energy futures. Um, and then specific to bioenergy development, uh, there's been some work done by Eaton and others um, drawing on this concept of socio-technical imaginaries for different kinds of renewable energy, including woody biomass. Um, their observation was, quote, Imaginaries for bioenergy derive from state actors who envision a future where energy and economic interests will be met with homegrown resources, providing green means to address salient social problems such as the nation's dependence on foreign and domestic fossil fuel supplies, climate change, pollution, environmental degradation, national energy security, and rural economic depression. The term imaginary connotes these, the way these visions provide an attainable end goal or a collective vision of a feasible, desirable future social order provided by technological projects. So here we're talking about this view of bioenergy as simultaneously addressing all of these interrelated issues. Um, let's see, yet this, bio this bioenergy imaginary uh, has definitely not gone uncontested. Uh, these different stakeholders promote or subscribe to different imaginaries and they have very different motives for doing so. So one of 
the competing claims is that biofuels is a scam. People are selling an unviable product to enrich its proponents. Government subsidies for biofuels, um, which range from the, the specific plants, such as range fuels, which we'll talk about in a minute, to military spending on things like the Great Green Fleet. Um, these have been criticized as wasteful government spending. So a second imaginary focuses on public health and environmental justice. Supplying pellets to Europe's wood-burning, power-generating plants, which are often called incinerators by opponents, is sometimes referred to as turning the U.S. into a European resource colony. So interpreting these biomass power plants as incinerators calls attention to different air pollution concerns related to burning wood and has raised environmental justice concern, especially when these plants are located near minority communities. So a third alternative imaginary revolves around the ecological impacts of energy. Questions about renewability and carbon neutrality have been raised. Environmental groups have maintained that bioenergy threatens to push forests, which are valuable for sustainable forest products, tourism, and cultural resources, basically to the brink of disaster by causing irreparable harm through deforestation and degradation. Different environmental and conservation organizations have expressed concern that bioenergy can have potential impacts um, ranging from soil erosion, decreased water quality and quantity, and conversion and deterioration of wildlife habitat in exchange for only very modest greenhouse gas reductions. So all of these different imaginaries regarding bioenergy are all based in various scientific disciplines. But as we know, science has a long history of being used strategically. And our research has worked to explain how these different types of imaginaries are circulating about wood-based bioenergy and how various actors use very specific language and linguistic mechanisms to persuade others um, of the benefits and risks of bioenergy development. So this is a visualization of how uh, wood-based bioenergy is supposed to work. Um, it shows how rural development works with local wood markets and how these have positive global environmental impacts. In reality, there are factors that complicate this picture, and that's what we're going to talk about today, some of those complicating factors. However, this graphic does do a good job of showing the interconnections between these various natural and social systems involved in bioenergy production. So this graphic um, is just a picture of different uh, wood-based bioenergy facilities in the U.S. South. So this was accurate at the time of our research, um, so probably around 2011, 2012. Um, and today some of these uh, facilities have closed or changed hands or diversified, but the density of wood-based bioenergy plants remains concentrated in the U.S. South specifically in the coastal areas of Georgia and North Carolina, main, mainly due to the proximity of ports that are sending these wood pellets by ship to Europe to meet their renewable energy targets. And we should note that this graphic was produced by the Southern Environmental Law Center, which vehemently opposes wood-based bioenergy due to what they describe as vast clear-cutting of mature forests, including vulnerable wetlands, which serve as a global carbon sink as well as uh, health effects on local people. So this picture from that perspective shows just how much forest land is actually in danger. Other people, of course, say that there's plenty of wood available for all of these energy facilities and that they actually serve as an incentive for landowners to keep planting trees rather than to sell out to developers. So we've talked a little bit about um, Let's see, this is our research design. We're going to talk a little bit about the four main topics here, the energy, landscape, climate, and race, and how all those are interconnected. We looked at this through three main conceptual frames. Uh, we've talked a bit about imaginaries. Uh, scale and translation were also very important. Um, the issue of scale is both an issue of salient concern in the natural resources, in the natural sciences, and also in the academic domains that approach their subject from a more critical perspective. Um, Levin, for instance, describes scale as, quote, the fundamental conceptual problem in ecology, if not all of science. While the politics of scale, a phrase coined by Smith in 1984, 
explicitly acknowledges that scale is a social construction. It's neither a predefined geographical territory nor politically neutral. So this has always been an important component of ethnographic research. Uh, it's commonly accepted among ethnographers that society or any subset of society is composed of multiple actors acting with multiple sources of knowledge operating at multiple scales of governance. Multiscalar research has emerged in recent decades as a way to add both spatial and temporal dimensionality to topics as complex as bioenergy, where all these scales are interconnected and where there are definitely disconnects that are happening between policies and consequences at different levels. So another conceptual framework that guided our analysis was that of translation. So the topic of translation is one that for centuries um, has attracted a lot of scholarly attention and debate. And in the last century, this legacy has continued across a number of fields. This includes um, philosophy, linguistics, semiotics, comparative literature, anthropology, and a lot of others. Uh, recent debates have been informed by movements like feminism, post-structuralism, post-colonial studies, indigenous studies, the ontological turn, and we've witnessed the emergence of new field of translation studies in recent decades. So as anthropologists, uh, we're particularly attuned to these questions of translation. Um, it's, based, it's, it's the basis of ethnography. It's that it's not an exaggeration to say that ethnography is itself a form of translation. Um, and so what we're talking about here is not just translation you know, between languages, but actually intralingual translation. Um, and there's also been a persistent strain of work concerned with questions concerning how translation functions within the context of a language community. Um, and so what we want to bring to attention here is that it's not just understanding the words, but it's how these words are used strategically by different people and for what motives. And this comes down to a question of, of power. Uh, our conception of translation in this research is that the process is inevitably laden with power and a attention to the politics of translation is a necessary component to understanding these contexts that are marked by power asymmetries. So in the context of this research, um, attending to the politics of translation has allowed us to engage with both the strategic and the unintentional ways that actors um, are giving voice to or contesting these various narratives and imaginaries as they cycle through these, um, these um, processes of bioenergy development. And we did this through various kinds of ethnography. So for those of you who are not anthropologists, um, traditional ethnography usually involves living in one place, one community for a year or more. Um, we didn't live in any of these for a whole year. We stayed about three months in our three primary sites. Um, and we lived in the community. We joined a lot of different kinds of clubs and organizations, everything from running clubs to garden clubs, uh, civic organizations. We went to churches, all kinds of things. Um, we went to, we did a lot of public events such as talks about our research. Um, and at those places, we described who we were, what we were doing, asked for volunteers for interviews. We formally introduced our research at city council and county commissioner meetings, and we spoke with those community leaders personally. Uh, we attended local events. Some people actually became pretty close friends. And throughout all this, we conducted formal semi-structured interviews, which we immediately transcribed. And we also kept field journals and took field notes. So while this was going on, we also attended and participated in a number of different bioenergy conferences and webinars over the course of several years. And we view these events as an extension of that community-based fieldwork. The, the network of actors that attend these regional workshops are also considered a community. And these were places where pro-bioenergy uh, imaginaries were perpetuated and honed. This is happening while the reality is playing out on the ground in these communities. Um, so the notes and interviews were entered into in vivo qualitative analysis software and coded to look for the main recurring themes. So the conceptual framework developed from the ground up 
This is kind of known as grounded theory. So we knew kind of to look for the main, the main themes, but the ways that they interacted on the ground unfolded through this process of data analysis. And then these main themes of imaginary scale and translation also emerged from that process. So these are our three primary field sites. Uh, we had other field sites in other states as well. Uh, we were pri primarily focused on looking at liquid fuels, uh, but they were coming and going sometimes while we were actually there in the site. Um, and so we added one uh, wood pellet facility as well because they were actually buying wood and producing, producing fuels. Um, so we're also drawing here on interviews we did in other states, specifically ones with minority landowners, in which we asked about valuation of land and forests and also about energy and rural development issues. So this is um, some of the factors that we found to be complicating the pro-bioenergy imaginary in the U.S. South. And again, you've got a lot of different actors that are promulgating these competing narratives about wood-based bioenergy. The landscape in the U.S. South is a cultural landscape, like all are, with complex and overlapping meanings and valuations. Climate, we found that concern about climate change was not a driving factor in the local communities for bioenergy development. And we have to <clears throat> always keep in mind that the rural South is is uh, steeped in this complicated and painful racial history and that these directly affect bioenergy development. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the landscape and this, uh, the U.S. South has a very long history of dependence on forest products, both hardwood and softwood, um, starting with different kinds of turpentine, lumber, pulp and paper, pine straw, and now woody biomass uh, for both liquid fuels and for wood pellets. And there's a lot of communities that have always depended on, on forestry for employment. <clears throat> so the ownership of southern forests, as we can see in the U.S. South, is uh, almost all, a very high percentage of it is privately owned. Uh, there's some industrial forest owners, the big companies like Weyerhaeuser, Plum Creek. Um, but the vast majority is owned by private landowners, and these are the ones that are going to be supplying you know, these wood-based bioenergy facilities. It's going to be coming off private land. So this is very different um, than, say, out west, where there's a lot more publicly owned land. People value forests and trees for a lot of different reasons. It's definitely not all eco economic. Um, e economics is part of it. Some people are producing for timber or non-timber income. A lot of people view um, it has a long-term investment. They're planting trees now for their kids' college expenses and things like that, or their own retirement. People really value the aesthetics of forests. They just like being out in forest. Recreation, that's everything from taking a walk in the woods to hunting to four-wheeling, all kinds of things. Wildlife, both game and non-game species. Um, hunting, but also just um, enjoying seeing the wildlife and knowing that they're part of a functioning ecosystem. Family heritage is a huge part of it here in the, in the southeast, um, land that's been in people's families for many generations. And it's often a big part of community identity as well. So this is, um, this is a picture of uh, the Pine Tree Festival uh, in Swainsboro. So the identity of a lot of communities in the southeastern U.S. is intricately tied to a history with forestry. Um, so in this photo, you see a float that showcases the slogan for that year, which was money grows on trees. Um, as you can see, there's beauty queens and cheerleaders and there's basketball players and there's obviously um, a racial component here as well. And I would say that it pretty accurately represents a lot of uh, small towns in the south today. So the U.S. South, as I mentioned, is definitely a cultural landscape. There's a lot of layers here of history, a lot of different histories that happened simultaneously. Um, there's a lot of human interaction with the environment. We're drawing here on the UNESCO definition, which includes um, the presence of both tangible and intangible cultural values in the landscape itself. And again, there's a lot of layers of history here. 
um, back to slavery and, and before. And this, uh, this landscape is constantly evolving, both ecologically and socially. So I'm going to let John talk now. That works. Okay, so I'm so I'm going to pick up with the uh, with the um, the race component, where we know you know that the South has a really complicated history with race, beginning with slavery, then moving into share sharecropping, and and that affects um, um, who owns the land, the way communities function. Um, so, so, so many different aspects of the South. So, so it's it, you know some people would like to think that it's in the past, but it is still still very much in the present, and um, and and so we endeavored while we were in these communities to meet with uh, both white and black landowners and community members. Um, uh, let's see here. And uh, you know, you know, so some of the specific ways that we found found race to be um, impacting uh, bioenergy development was one was because of in through employment when, when 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 these plants that you saw pictures of were being b built, um, there were a lot of questions about who got the jobs and why did people get the jobs. Uh, uh, some of that, you know, people thought it was hired through good old boy networks. You know, people people hired their friends, which didn't often reach into the black community. Um, sometimes people felt that there were, uh, you know, so, uh, somewhat arbitrary e education requirements that prevented um, black people in the community from getting those jobs, as well as issues re relating to, um, you know, past uh, brushes with the law, as well as, you know, drug use and things like that, that really, um, uh, you, know, you know, there wasn't a lot of effort to, to overcome that, to reach out to, uh, you know, to other sides of the community. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody is undereducated or uses drugs, but, um, but I'm just saying that uh, they, they either just weren't Included, they didn't get the word, or they had specific ob obstacles that were used as an excuse, perhaps, not to hire them. Uh, in terms of the landowners, so bioenergy develop development is interesting because it has both the plant as well as as well as uh, the land where the private forest landowners supply the product that feeds into the plant. And um, so, minority landowners have very uh, Complicated land tenure issues. They tend to own much more land, much less land than white landowners. Um, they've had, you know, tremendous difficulty obtaining and holding on to land over time, and oftentimes because of their uh, poor access to the legal system, that land is in a status called heirs, heirs' property, where it ends up to be held in common by a bunch of different heirs, and that makes it particularly difficult to, uh, to sell wood and improve your forests and things like that. And then also just because of the uh, historic, um, really exclusion of black landowners from the general forestry um, practices and knowledge and meetings and committees that get people together, they, they weren't as prepared as many other landowners to take advantage of opportunities, you know, through through that lack of experience, and kind of the third area where race comes into play, uh, particularly at a plant that was proposed in um, Wadley, Georgia, is environmental justice. Um, if uh, you know feelings that the plants or even the industrial parks in these communities are located in places where they have a disproportionate impact on minority communities through noise, through pollution, through other kinds of things. So you have a, a bunch of different, a different, bunch of different layers to the race issue. Um, it, you know, so we just can't ignore race just to go back. You know, we have to sort of, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable to deal with it. I'm, I remember when we, um, we left us, a city council meeting, and we got in the landowner of 
I, we, we got in the car with a black community member who was pretty vocal, and it's like, oh, you know, God, what's going to happen to our research project if everybody saw us driving away? Will the white people still talk to us? But they did, and, 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 and it was fine. But it's something you really have to spend time in the community uh, to, to, to learn how it functions and to, um, to get people to open up to you about these kinds of issues. Um, so shifting gears a little bit to climate change, um, and we're going to sort of talk about this sort of hierarchy about how important climate change is. And the scientific papers that relate to bioenergy, climate change is often the most important things. That's why we need bioenergy to address climate change through a renewable energy source. Um, and, and then policy and advocacy documents also put, put climate change as either central or secondary uh, in, importance in promoting bioenergy. And the interesting thing is, as we go down to our conferences, to the landowners, at conferences, people sort of um, try to hedge or try to hedge their bets because they know that there's a lot of disbelief about climate change in the rural communities and many of the presenters, and I'll show some examples in a, in a second, try to say, well, you know, climate change is important if you believe it, or this is important, whether or not you believe in, in climate change. Uh, you know, so the presenters, even if they might believe in climate change, feel necessary to, um, you know, to, uh, to sort of dance around the issue a little bit to, uh, to reach people at the local level. And, um, and then at the community level, we, um, we found climate not to be an important consideration. Um, you know, sometimes people believe it, sometimes they don't. Um, uh, but there were many deniers. And um, you know, this is kind of an example of you know, scale as you, you work your way down the climate change importance just becomes d d diminished as you go down. Um, some examples here um, uh, from the field sites. I mean, you know, even, even like, like one of the foresters says to us, well, you'd have, uh, you'd have a hard time telling people in Mississippi that climate change is man-made. Uh, um, you know, so maybe you, you deal with that by talking about changes in the weather or, or, or things like that, but, but, but people are not really ready to believe that people are causing climate change. It, and then the second quote here more, more, more illustrates the question that comes up in a, a lot of people's m m minds is if you're going to you know, cut down all these trees with mechanized harvesting equipment, drive them in a truck to the plant, make pellets out of them, put them on a train, then put them on a ship and send them to Europe, you know, you know, you know, how is that really a renewable resource? It's, so it begins to bring up questions about that. And um, you, know, you know, we see even like the CEO in the third quote of one of the companies uh, is, you know, yes, 10 scientists about it, you get 11 different opinions. It's always, you know, easy to, to um, make fun of the scientists. <laughs> um, and, um, but, uh, but, 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 but there's an effort to say that, that we need to do this, this, this bioenergy development in spite of that um, uh, to, you know, ac account for this fact that climate change diminishes in importance. Um, you know, here's some examples in, uh, from, from conferences. Some of these are just fun to read. Uh, telling a European that climate change is a hoax. Hoax is like telling a Southern Christian there's no Jesus. Um, uh, you, know, you know, half the room believes it, half it doesn't. You know, it's a good thing. This is a way people kind of hedge their bets. Uh, you know, the effort to say that climate change is political, not, not scientific, which uh, is probably not true. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then some people that just, you know, c come right out and embrace the climate change aspect in conferences, but you don't necessarily see that going out into the local communities. Um, so that kind of concludes the four, four main, um, you know, uh, uh, themes that we have in the book and in the research. Uh, but, but just to take a little bit of a deep dive into one field site, uh, Soperton, Georgia, which um, looks like a lot of small towns here in the south right now. And um, the things that really distinguish Soperton, Georgia, is they call themselves the Million Pine City. And um, 
uh, they believe that they were, they were the, are the birthplace of intensive silviculture, actually you know, planting trees and so, uh, sort of growing trees intentionally in plantations. Uh, the Soperton News was the first newspaper printed on, um, on paper made from pine pulp, so th th they're very proud of that. There's a, there's a copy of it in the Smithsonian Institution because of that. Um, and so this, this sort of history of being the first in so many things sort of led them to believe that it was a really good idea to jump on the bioenergy bandwagon because they'd been first in so many other tree-related things. So, so they, were, they were set for the next uh, thing that came along. Um, you know, and here you can see they, you know, they really kind of buy into this imaginary, which is that, 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 that bioenergy is going to reduce our dependence on foreign sources, it's going to provide a renewable energy source, it's going to uh, provide jobs for rural communities, and so the community leaders really kind of, kind of, kind of bought into that bioenergy imaginary. Um, and, and, we're, and we're very excited about it, but, th but that's also, um, as you can see when you get down to the lower two quotes, um, those community leaders represent uh, people that own more land, that have more at stake in terms of b b b businesses and things like that. So, so even though they're jumping on it, not everybody is feeling the same way that they do as the community really begins to uh, to um, try to engage in, in bioenergy. So, so what actually happens? Uh, so the, the range fuels plant was, uh, the construction began in 2007, and, and it's important, uh, I think, to look at the, the financing of it, because this affected a lot of the perceptions of it, uh, that there was a large Department of Energy grant, the Secretary of Energy at the time. This was in uh, the Bush administration, Bush the, Bush the second, um, that um, the Secretary of Energy came down to break ground for the plant, right? So that's a big deal. And, uh, but they also got a grant from the state of Georgia. They got a big USDA loan guarantee. And you know they, they put in some of their own money too, but, but local people became very suspicious about you know, you know, why is all this government money being put, put in to promote the development of this bioenergy plant and ask questions about who is actually benefiting from that. And so that, that begins to develop kind of some opposition because they're, they're very, very conservative population, but also some very anti-government anti or this was kind of in the Tea Party days when they wanted to, to reduce government expenditures. So that began to, to raise some suspicions about you know, about what was actually going on here. Um, some of the things that we see that actually happen when this, you know, clean, neat, very attractive bioenergy imaginary um, meets the ground is that many of these government incentives are tied to, um, uh, to investment in p p poor communities. So that encourages these plants to locate in poor communities, which maybe have more at stake and are going to be more likely to be hurt if the plant is is not successful than a community that is, has has a more diversified economy. Um, the other thing is that uh, these communities have to commit to bioenergy. They have to oftentimes give a site and guarantee some tax benefits to the company uh, before the. You know, this is a, a brand new industry, and there's uh, initial public offerings to fund the development of the site. And sometimes they have to they have to do all that before the the IPO is actually even 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 happened. Like one community, Waycross, I think, gave their last uh, site in their industrial park to a bioenergy company. So they're making that commitment. And it turns out that many of these plants, um, so, some of them never broke ground, some of them moved, some of them f failed. Um, range fuels itself, which was producing cellulosic ethanol, um, did not uh, s succeed in producing cellulosic e ethanol. They produced methanol, which is actually apparently quite easy to produce. Um, and, and, and so, um, so that leaves these communities kind of on the hook f th through this process, and, 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 and it, 
it's also demoralizing to the community, and I think really, it really harms the process of bioenergy development in the long run by raising these suspicions tied again to you know the government money that went into making this this happen. Um, you know, th th the other thing um, that that was clear when we talked to forest landowners is a, a, a lot of people in the forest industry believe if you offer people money, they'll 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 sell their trees and believe that people will intensify their forest management, grow shorter rotations, and things like that. If uh, these bioenergy plants are are there and created, but in fact, people have um, much more nuanced um, r relationships to their f to their forest. Um, you know, for wildlife, for recreation. Um, you know, it turns out most of the money is not in the you know the stuff that's cut for bioenergy, but in the stuff that's cut for timber. And and so, so you know, I would guess I'd say that um, viewing landowners as simple economic actors um, overestimates their ability to adapt and to provide the product that, that is needed to run the bioenergy plant. Um, and, and then the complex racial dynamics can lead to, 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 to uneven costs and benefits. Um, and uh, you know, like even in the case of, of the Wadley plant that I mentioned, even the, the, the plant eventually got, uh, got canceled because of the environmental justice concerns. And then finally, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, as so the justification for public investment in bioenergy is primarily for climate change with, you know, secondary issues for energy independence and for, for, and for rural development, but the communities don't really believe in climate change. And, and so that create, you know, so, so why bioenergy if we're not concerned about climate change? Is it just another way to create a market for trees? And if so, why is the government spending so much money uh, promoting that? So these kinds of issues come up. Um, you know, some of the specific issues we, we found in these communities, um, a fear of health and safety risks. People were afraid in Soperton, for example, that the plant was going to blow up. Um, some, some of that was related to there was a, a, a new school that was close to the plant and they didn't want you know, to blow up and hurt their kids. But some people were also opposed to the spending the money for the school. So it's not really clear whether that was just an excuse you know, to, try to try to kill the school, kill the new school. It, uh, but, uh, it, but emissions and truck traffic are a big deal. Most of these towns are um, sort of forest product friendly communities. They're not uh, unaccustomed to seeing, you know, truck traffic, but they do have an impact on the roads. They do change the air quality, things like that. So those are important. Um, em employment, you know, there's not an, it, it, there's the issue of how many jobs are created, but also who gets those jobs that are created. and and. Um, uh, oftentimes, certain groups feel they're excluded from that. Um, landowners' d d disappointment and, and you know, an expectation that with a bioenergy plant, they were going to get more money from their timber. They were going to, almost all of these companies come in promising they're going to take uh, tops and limbs and slash, but, but none of them ever do. They just take pulp wood because uh, the tops and limbs get uh, tangled up with sand and dirt and things like that. And it's also not very economically viable to pick up these smaller pieces of, uh, of, of trees. So landowners are kind of promised that this is going to lead to new markets, but it really didn't. Now, it, it, it may have kept the pulp wood price up a little higher, but, uh, but it certainly didn't create some really obvious new market for landowners. And, and then, of course, the failure of the plants were just a real disappointment for, uh, for, for people in Soperton, as you can see here. You know, you know, and, it, and, it, and it does, you know, the fact that you go in and you try and you fail creates this kind of disapproval or dislike of bioenergy that has an impact into the future. Now, what happened with the Soperton plant is, is interesting because um, an another com company, Lanzatech came in and purchased it. Now they purchased it, the whole, that whole plant that we saw in a couple pictures for 5.1 million, which was 0.1 million over the offer from the guy that was going to cut it up for scrap. So, 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 
so they got it for a cheap price, and, and, and they've been using it ever since then. That, I don't know when they got it, 2013, 2014? 2012, okay. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, so they use it kind of as an experimental plan to, to run some different things, because they, and, um, but now they're trying to use it to produce jet fuel for British Airways, because there's this demand for, you know, sustainable, renewable jet fuel. And it's also true that, that Lanzatech came in and, um, and did things differently. They weren't quite so secretive as range fuels were, they reached out to the community more, and, um, and, 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 and I think that just highlights that there's different ways that companies can come into a community. If people have this you know, top secret technology that is not actually proven, then they wanna, they wanna kinda hide everything, but that's not really good for community relationship. Um, So, you know, so we have this idea of this socio-technological imaginary that's um, being um, promoted around bioenergy through this new technology. We're going to solve all these different environmental and social problems. It's promoted as a win-win-win. Um, the liquid fuels projects all failed, both Kior and, and range fuels failed. Um, we were excited about Kior because they had actually, they were the only plant in the U.S. to sell at a commercial scale um, uh, a liquid fuel, but they went bankrupt shortly thereafter. They were, I think they were pegged for, get, they were to be profitable if gas prices were like 5.35 a gallon, which hasn't happened very many times since then. Um, and even when the projects succeed, there's these, these uncertainties about the social, economic, and ec ecological risks. So, you know, so part of the issue here is that one, there are these kind of other imaginaries that relate to bioenergy, to rural development, to government that are out there too that compete with the bioenergy imaginary, which is developed at this very high level by by, um, by powerful interest groups, uh, both in the community and within the, at the government, without a lot of c consultation or sharing with people at the local level. And that, um, I think that makes the imaginaries really v v vulnerable to sort of encroachment from these other imaginaries. So, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, the government is just supporting a bunch of people to, you know, so they can get rich, but we're not gonna get anything out of it. Those, those kinds of things, and so I think you know, in in some, uh, you know, you know, we have all the, you know, we have this very simple, powerful imaginary, but when it gets out of there on the ground, things are much more complicated, and um, and um, in this case, uh, caused a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, pe pe people were not enthusiastic about the results, I guess, and pe people actually really thought they'd been taken advantage of, their communities have been taken advantage of. Um, that's it. Um, we're happy to answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we have some questions, but uh, if you don't mind repeating questions so we can get it out. Oh. No, so part of it was because they didn't have the technology worked out um, in advance. Range, you know, so, so range fuels had a, exper so the question was, I just remembered I was supposed to do that. The, uh, the, uh, the question was, why did the plants fail? The plants didn't, didn't really f fail because of lack of social engagement. So you could ask, well, what would have happened if the plant had been successful, but they really, failed because they didn't have the technology worked out. In Kior's case, the technology uh, turned out to be too expensive. The catalyst was being e e used up in the process, and, and, and they thought they could keep using it over and over again. In, in range fuels, they just never really made it work. Um, but, you know, but, but I think what that ref reflects is 
So this question of sort of a government subsidized plan coming in with a lot of uh, promises and commitment to promises to the community and commitments from the community w with an uncertain technology and also that's not really uh, has it doesn't really understand so where their product is going to come from, who's going to work in the plant, and things like that. You know, that just sort of all comes together to create this real, real disappointment in the plant. Um, you know, but, but I do think it's an interesting question to say what would happen if it had been a, a success, the counter, you know, the counter example. But you still would have seen many of these other issues related to race and jobs and forest land owners. And things like that, but the plants, you know, you know, we we were not hoping that the plants failed. We wanted them to be successful, and they kept they uh, they kept shutting down on us basically while we were doing the research. Uh, Thanks, Stephen. Steve. Precisely because it seems like after discussing imaginaries, you, you kind of move into the taking apart of those imaginaries. Mm -hmm. Where potentially, I mean, so the idea is, if I'm understanding it correctly, these are kind of motivations. But couldn't one simply say interests as well? Right? I mean, in other words, if we're, we're allow you're allowing for certain, uh, I guess not, imagine, you know, there's, it's, yeah. it's a generous same time, I'm wondering why is it you stick with it if it, rather than say a, a discourse analysis, a stakeholder analysis, and those kinds of things, there might be more political. Yeah, that's a good question, and we'll, we'll let Sarah chime in on this one for sure. But I think a part of the reason is that, you know, the, this idea that imaginaries, you know, sort of promote technological solutions to a variety of social and environmental ills. They're, they're kind of constructed by powerful interest groups and, and sort of used to, um, you, know, you know, they're not really any single fact, any single organization that, that performs them so much. You know, they're, uh, they come from the government, they come from private industry, they're just kind of out there in this general sense, but that drives so much of the enthusiasm for something like, like bioenergy, um, and so it, it helps understand th that aspect, which sort of s sets up the power dynamic, and and um, and uh, you know it, it helps to you know I, I don't think imaginaries are bad. Almost everything is promoted sort of through an imaginary sort of situation, but um, but if the imaginary is not solid underneath and not transparent, if it's not transparent that this is a renewable resource, if it's not clear that the technology is still in a very experimental s mental stage, the imaginary sort of, uh, sort of glosses over all of those th things and sets up so much of the conflict that takes place around it. I must have some. <laughs> I feel like I'm hogging okay. the mic. No, no, no. So yeah, absolutely, I mean, what, what John said, but I think we stuck with it because the imaginary sort of implies a holism, the way that these different elements work together. And we, we have several papers out about this in addition to the book about you know different competing imaginaries that sort of diverge at different points. For example, there's an imaginary that climate change is real, for example, and one imaginary says, and biofuels is a good solution for that. And there's another one that says, but biofuels is not a good solution for that. And those are, you know, there's a lot of different elements at play there that are holistic in themselves. And so I think, you know, we did do a lot of discourse analysis. We did narrative analysis. Um, we did very specific metaphor analysis. We looked at the, like, the specific phrasing that people used and the way that people pass on ideas through certain words, both strategically and unintentionally. So we, we did do that as well. Um, but for me, at least, it all kind of came back to Imaginaries just because it kind of pulled all these elements together. 
That's Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that's a complicated question for sure. Um, so, you know, as a forest service researcher, we're both um, expected to, you know, do good scientific research, but also not to rock the boat politically <laughs> to, to some extent. You know, you have to kind of, kind of find your balance between that. Um, but, uh, but our initial funding came from, from the Forest Service, and then the secondary funding came from from USDA because people recognized that what what they call was social acceptability that these that bioenergy ha has a social acceptability problem now now we don't we didn't think that social acceptability is not really a social science term and 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 so you have to unpack that and sort of redefine it so um the you know the funny thing about it is that i think um some of the foresters and other people in town thought we were trying to to rile up the community and sort of find problems with it, where some of the other people in town thought we were like a front for a new bioenergy company <laughs> that was that was going to come in, and and you know so I think we kind of I don't think anybody really trusted us, but but that's why you know we spent like three months in each town and 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 you know and and the Forest Service has a different relationship than other government agencies. We walked into one. Um, wood processing plant and we asked if we could talk to them and they said we'll talk to you if you're not from the government and i said well actually i am from the government <laughs> but i'm from the forest service I said oh you're okay you give us money or something so so we had this you know you know i don't think you can ever be neutral and, and i don't know if i was any more compromised than any other people maybe i got some credibility from some people for being with the forest service suspicion from other people it's uh, you know it's uh, I th the really interesting thing was how each group sort of saw us in a negative light to some extent based on their own I in interests. I don't think that we were clearly on, you know, we tried to not really be on any one side, which is a very hard thing to do in a community with a lot of divisions. Um, I don't know, does that more? Yeah. Uh, it was AFRI, um, uh, which is um, NIFA, you know, the, 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 sort of the research arm of USDA. Um. Uh, after you kind of completed your stay with the communities and, and um, had, you know, had time to, to produce some of the findings, um, what were some of your techniques for going back and sharing some of the results with the community and how did they react to anything that you had to, to say? If, yeah. It's public and we've shared, you know, some of the writing. Yeah. We, we didn't, like we have in other projects, specifically go back and sort of do presentations or, you know, do the, we did share some with particularly folks from So Pretend, you know, who, you know, some people thought we were pretty much on target. Um, but um, I don't know. I think we felt like pulled in a lot of different directions there. It, it wasn't clear we had one group to go back to. Both, uh, you know, you know, the Lanza Tech plant was operating at a really low level. The Keyor plant had failed, and uh, Georgia Biomass, you know, continued to to buy timber. Although it's so, sort of always been up for sale, it, it seems ever since then. That's a good question. 
Um, yeah, so the question is, to repeat it, is, uh, you know, does it, does who's actually buying it affect the local debate? I, I mean, there's thing, you know, Sarah mentioned that, um, you know, one of the people say we're becoming a c colony to Europe, and, you know, we fought a war to uh, stop that, the Revolutionary War, <laughs> you know, you know, so it kind of fits into that neat little, little picture of European, but I'm sure they could find something for Asia, <laughs> for Asia. <laughs> as well. Um, um, yeah. All right. So Sarah's mentioning that, you know, it, it made a big difference in people's perception that Lanza Tech didn't take public, uh, public loans or public, uh, <laughs> public grants because they, they were seen like as a more legitimate company because that where people suspected the other companies were kind of taking money from the taxpayers for something that wasn't going to work, which, you know, turned out not to work. Um, so, but in terms of the, you know, the fact that the timber companies keep buying each other up and changing names <laughs> and stuff like that, I don't, most people don't even know who the company is, you know, that actually ends up with their trees. They go a lot of different directions. So I'm not sure that's a major issue. But in terms of the companies, I think, um, uh, I mean, Georgia Biomass is a wholly owned subsidiary of RWE, a big energy company in e Europe. Not, you know, and, and a lot of people did say they would be a lot happier if the products were, st were staying in the United States. So there's this thing, well, this is, this would be a, a lot better if if we were using them here, if there was a market locally. Um, so it, it does enter in around the edges for sure, I think. I, I sense from you know, the, the timing of your research and, and some of the graphics you show that this this um, kind of industry was it was almost like a little bubble that was happening in 2011 during the time you were doing the research. What is the current status of bioenergy today is yeah well that's a good question i mean i mean, I mean there was a, a big bioenergy boom in the late 70s when there was an energy crisis and, and then it kind of faded away and then it came back and some people say well you know i've seen this story before and then i think particularly the liquid fuels because they were so subsidy driven uh, did kind of fade away the pellets have you know kept have have kept going. I still don't think there's a liquid fuels plant that's producing anything at a commercial scale. But I think with the uh, the war in Ukraine and the energy issues in um, in Europe, people you know you see in in the news, people are beginning to talk about renewable energy again. And there's this idea that the South's strength is in wood-based bioenergy. So if the South is going to be a player in renewable energy, it should be through bioenergy.